and um, okay, all right. Um, well, let's move these faces somewhere. That's it. All right. Well, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Eddie O'Sullivan of the Irish Brigade uh, website, Irish Brigade www uk and uh, co-hosting this with my brother Richard. I'm in London, which is in Windsor, and we have people from the United Kingdom and Ireland with us today, which is marvellous. Uh, this is the second of a series of three Zoom talks about the Irish Brigade in Northern Italy in the final nine months of the Second World War. So last time we discussed uh, the role, its role in the attack on the Gothic Line in the High Apennine, south of Bologna, and the and it very bloody clash with German defenders on Monte Spadure, which led to decimated the fox. Um, comparatively high casualties, something like 300 men killed, wounded, missing or taken prisoner in that part of the war up in the higher Pennines. And last time we were joined, amazingly, by the 98-year-old Irish Brigade veteran, Robbie Robinson, who at that point was sergeant, soon be sergeant major in the fox role at first uh, Royal Irish Fusiliers. It was an amazing experience for us. Um, that period in the uh, Gothic line, after they come back quickly from Egypt in the September, they were in the in the Apennines uh, for um, well, it was four or five months, wasn't it? It was October, November, December, January, four months. A lot of it was in really Arctic conditions, mainly uh, defensive positions, very difficult conditions with mud and the paths being absolutely very difficult to get anything up because the roads collapsed. The weather was inevitably poor, including snow. Um, and it's the toughest, many of the people who took through it said it was the toughest winter of the three that the Irish Brigade spent on the front line in the Second World War. Uh, this, um, so, uh, this is going to, this story is going to be about uh, a completely different type of warfare which takes place not in the mountains but on the plains of Italy, and we'll come to that in a moment. And what I want to do is get to the... <laughs> Get to the next. Yes, here we are. Uh, this is a photograph of Colin Garner. Colin Garner was originally in the Kensingtons. He's a Brummie, a uh, Berman boy, Coventry, actually. He went to school with Philip Larkin and he exchanged notoriously a series of letters after the war uh, between them. Um, but at this point, um, uh, Colin Garner had uh, become a, a lieutenant in the um, Fox. He transferred out of the Kensingtons, which is the heavy support regiment formation of the Irish Brigade, and he became a platoon commander and served in the attacking Monte Spadero. At the end of January, um, after four months in the field, the Irish Brigade was moved out of the front line and spent time in Florence, which I think you all have heard of. This provided an opportunity to deal with outstanding disciplinary issues, and Colin Gunner was appointed as defence counsel for the Fogs, for Fogs charged with desertion. And he writes it in his, his book, End of the Line. Um, I shall read from his account of the trials that he was the defense counsel for. And he says this, uh, one on trial was the youngest soldier in B Company of the Fogs. He was a fair haired, nervous boy who should have been pedaling a bike around the streets of Belfast with the meat basket on the handlebars, not sitting frightened to death on the verge of tears in this macaroni Dartmoor. And um, what had happened, um, the fusilier said he'd injured his foot Monte Grande near Sabaduro and taken the wrong turn in and when he left the dressing station and Gunnar argued it was a terrible mistake. Um, the accused agreed to return to the Fox and the Gunnar says this was his sole success in the number of trials for desertion from the Fox. Um, in the 10 days he was a court-martial defence counsel and it wasn't just the Fox, it was uh, pervasive um, in the 8th Army, 78th Division included at this point of the war. Um, dozens of Irish Brigade members deserted during campaigns or over the, whole, over the whole period. Not many of them very well recorded. Most returned of their own will uh, without prosecution were reprimanded, but some were sentenced to hard labor, forced to complete their period of service after they'd done that. So these stories are kind of buried, but it was there. And the fact is that desertion in the 8th Army uh, peaked in the autumn and winter of 1944. In, in Northern Italy at this point. Um, its field court marshal convicted more than 2,000 men of desertion in this period, as a year as a whole, as I've before. And it actually led to calls, uh, which were finally supported by Harold uh, uh, Alexander, who was the 
supreme commander, um, uh, he actually called for the restoration of the death penalty, which of course was used in the First World War. It had been used in the Second World War on Allied troops. Um, this was firmly resisted at higher levels politically. Um, I guess the British Army in 1945 was mainly a citizen army, and mainly made up of conscripts. And so, and, and what was now was now described as post-traumatic stress was in fact widespread among frontline troops. And anyway. My father used to dwell on it a little bit about the number of sergeants and people who had actually served in combat positions who, who were tried and, and finished up in detention at least, because they just couldn't take much more of it. Anyway, that's um, one part of the story. Let me just move on to the, the substance of what we're going to do today. This is a map, if you can see it, of the part of the uh, Italy that we're focusing on that. Town there is Ravenna, which is a place I recommend everybody to go to because of its well-famous Ostrogothic mosaics uh, here. This is the Romagna Plain, generally very flat, cut by watercourses. Here's the town of Forli, which I believe was the birthplace of Mussolini, Faenza, Imola, and then further up the, up the road that you can't see is Bologna, uh, which is a major industrial town. And at this point of the war, early in the 45, you begin to get the uprising of partisan uh, uprising across the whole of northern Italy, particularly in the industrial towns. Um, but we're not dealing with that, but that's the context. And um, the area we're going to be looking at is here. So in early February, the 78th Division returned to the 8th Army, and the Irish Brigade moved to Forley, there, near the Adriatic coast, to prepare for fresh frontline duties along the south banks of the Senia River north of the town. Now that blue line is roughly where the Senio flows. Comes out of the Apennines, close to where the Irish Brigade were in uh, October, November, December, and then flowed into the valleys and eventually into the Adriatic. The Brigade took over barracks in, in Forley and they renamed them the St. Patrick's Barracks. Um, and Forley also had an excellent nephew, which they named the Dorchester. A lot of these details can be found in Richard uh, Doherty's excellent book here the way which I recommend everybody should get a copy of. And uh, apparently the Expeditionary Forces Institute in, in Forley provided meals and entertainment for up to 10,000 men a day. Can you imagine that? And visitors uh, to the Forley to the, to the, to can take piano lessons as well as flowers, send flowers home. So by this point of the war, uh, the Eighth Army was very well organized uh, to be able to refresh and renew, revive, keep morale up and make sure people stayed in contact with their homes. This is January 45, the feeling in the air, the war couldn't last for much longer. Uh, the Soviets were right on, they had pushed right up into uh, close to the Oda. It was the, uh, the, the Ardennes offensive had basically come to a close. It was only a matter of time, weeks, months even before the war would be over. So at this point, keeping people's morale out and spirits high, engaged, was essential if the uh, the next the last phase of the war was carried out effectively. Now on the fourth of March, which of course is Barossa Day, the fog celebrated it. Um, um, and of course the, uh, the the fogs of the first uh, British infantry regiment, British Irish, to capture a Napoleonic hero. Uh, but the real job for the uh, Irish brigade was about twenty miles outside Forley, where the arrow is, south of Cognignola, and this involved monitoring and harassing German defenders on the north bank, mainly, of the Senio. The Senio was basically the front line at this point in the, the valley. The Allies had pushed up from December and had reached this point. They hadn't got to where they hoped to be by this point, but they'd reached this point. Um, and the brigade at this point was supplemented again by the 56th the Recce Regiment, Reconnaissance Regiment, uh, which was originally commanded by Kendall Shavas, um, who was originally a fog. Um, he had been promoted to a staff job by this point. He was still known as the Shabazz Horse. Uh, they were a recce regiment that used uh, armored cars, highly mobile. Uh, a few more uh, personal notes, incomplete set of photographs, but uh, here we are. Uh, by this point, this gentleman here with the berries, Richard McCreary, he was the commander of the 8th Army. And he's standing next to Mark Clark, commander of the 5th Army. So the two armies in the field in Italy were the, the British commanded 8th Army, the American commanded 5th Army, but these, this, the other army in Northern Italy was highly international. We had Indian Army, um, 
the Indian Army, Canadians, Poles, uh, Brazilians. Uh, you had a host of nationalities involved in the Italian campaign at this point. Um, let's go on. Uh, that is, at that point, the 78th Commander, Archibald Abothnutz, originally Black Watch. He took over in the middle of October of the 78th. Um, and just a couple of more characters we, who you're familiar with. Uh, the general of the pipe here is, uh, again, the Irish Brigade Commander Pat Scott, who had been appointed to this position at the start of 1944. Pre originally a FOG, previously commander of the first FOGs and then of the London Irish Rifles, he then was transferred out but when brought back into the Brigade Navy. 44, I had a formal reputation. And this gentleman here, wearing the, the harp of the London Irish Rifles and also the Royal Irish uh, Rifles, and the Hackle and the Corbin, that is Barla Braden, um, a legendary figure who at this point was originally commissioned into the Royal Ulster Rifles, so had some time in the end of the Board Division, and then returned to the infantry, um, was commander of the Six Skins in the field in the Casino where he was wounded, brought back to the brigade when he, uh, he had recovered his health, and for the rest of the war led the London Irish Rifles. Uh, a legendary figure, you can see there, in the Sydney, you can see the Battle Axe Division. You can also, he's got his airborne, he's got his, his para wings for someone who's, who's done the jumps. There are other two other uh, battalion commanders I haven't got the photographs of. I believe one is in your book, is Murphy Palmer, Richard, who is at this point was the commander of the Royal Irish Fusiliers and had taken over from John Horsfall, author of uh, three books, including this one, um, Fleeing Our Banners of the Wind, who had been commander of the Fogs. It's Padura that had been seriously wounded and invalided out. And the second battalion commander of the three infantry battalions of the Irish Brigade was uh, uh, Bob Shaw, wasn't it? Bob Shaw? Lieutenant Colonel Shaw. Oh, it was, was either Shaw or Scott at that stage. Was it on I think it was Shaw. I haven't got a photograph of him. Anyway, these are the figures. Could I, could I make one point? Uh, Mark Clark at this point was not the commander of Fifth Army. Oh. The Fifth Army was Lucian Truscott, and Mark Clark at this point is the commander of the uh, 15th Army Group. So he's the boss to both uh, McCreary and Truscott, and neither of the two of them trust him. Well, thank you very much, Richard. Um, I'm glad that you're here to correct me, because uh, I would uh, create all sorts of wrong impressions. Thanks very much, Richard. Please feel free to clip in when you, when you see some other problems. So this is a close-up of the map. Cotignola is this little town here. That's the Senio River running from uh, east to west. And this is the area, the little town of Gran Roma. And this is just to explain how things, there was a, the boundary for, the northern boundary for the, uh, for the brigade was there. And north it was the 36th Brigade, which is also in the 78th Division. But the, the Irish Brigade's um, next formation on the line was 56 reconnaissance, which had been brought under the command of the Irish Brigade, and it was playing the role as an, as an infantry formation at this point, and it was holding the Senio line, basically being overlooked by Cotignola. Um, next, the largest stretch, and this is about a mile, mile and a half perhaps in total, of the Senio uh, South Bank was, was being policed initially by the Fogs. Uh, next to them, also holding the rest of the Irish Brigade line, uh, was the second skins, and that's the boundary. And next to them were the Capadian lances. So this was the uh, from the Polish Corps, who were right next door on the boundary uh, with the Irish Brigade. We'll hear more about the Capadian lances in a minute. The London Irish Rifles initially were, were held in reserve close to Granarolo, Granarolo. Uh, but there was a rotation. The LIR eventually took over to the fogs, the fogs removed the skins. So it was a bit of a rotation. This, as I said, the front from the, the, the RFK front was about two and a half miles, uh, two miles, not, not particularly long. The opposition was the 98th Infantry Division of the German Army. And uh, the features they had on the river here at this point was a weir. And this area here where the Senio bulges out, I believe is the Bund. He called it the Bund. It was called, I think it was really called Ted's Bund, but it was a bulge, because basically, basically the basic concept was the Germans were on one side, uh, the Irish Brigade and the 78th Division on the other side, on the south side, but there were exceptions to this. 
there were places on the line where in fact the Germans held positions on the southern bank of the Senio. So there was one place here, do you see that black spot? There was a German encampment on the north, south bank of the Senio. Two more here, a third right on the Bund at this point. Now to help us understand what it looks like, it looked like then, you can take these photographs, if you're taking from Google map. As I mentioned, there's the weir here, and actually there's a bridge where the boundary is here. This photograph is actually taken from the bridge, looking towards um, where the skins were and towards where the Polish were, and that's the weir. So well, that is, it's, it's not as clear as it was then, but the Senio was embanked, and so they had a south bank and north bank to stop it flooding, because this is a floodplain. And this has been, these banks have been developed over the centuries. And these banks were 20 to 30 feet high. And what it created was a peculiar kind of entrenchment system <clears throat> because the river itself wasn't really much of a barrier to anybody. It was just an interference. Uh, but you had uh, on the south bank and, the, on the, on the, and, and on the north bank, you had embankments which were up to 30 feet high, which offered commanding positions for any machine gun positions or water positions. And these are the dominant features. Um, this other shot is looking the opposite direction. That's looking towards Cotignola, which is in the distance here. Same principle as the Senio River, the embankments on either side. Um, most of it, or much of it, the Germans held this side, which is the northern bank, whilst the Irish Brigade and the Allies held the southern bank, which is the southern side. Uh, but there were exceptions. And I've gone back, have I gone back and I'll get in the right direction? Right, uh, yeah. This arrow pointed, see that this is the river here. I've taken got a photograph to show you some sense. This is from the Irish Brigade side. This is the southern side on that part of the, and you can see the embankment. And this is very much as it was in 1945 with about 20 foot from the floodplain. And this, and with the bunt there in the distance. And this photograph, which was taken, I think, uh, in March, I can tell you more about it, gives you a sense of what it looked like then. You can see the, the head of the, the embankment there. That's the top of the embankment. And these are London Irish rifle men trying to go, they're actually tunneling into the Senio. So, so the Senio have been canalized and flood banks are built on both banks, uh, which are up to 30 feet high. The Germans have turned the Senio into a barrier, um, and the northern banks mainly held and fortified by the Germans, but in some places they were German submachine gun posts, and in between was the Senio. It, uh, the river meandered, and sometimes the Germans could see from their position into behind the, the, the Irish Gate lines, and sometimes the Irish Gate could see behind the German lines. Um, I'll now read a, a, a section from uh, Pat Scott's uh, narrative about this period. So he said this, when the brigade took over the sector, there were only five enemy outposts on the reverse of our flood banks. And one or two tunnels had been dug through our flood bank. The river wasn't straight, there were twists. And in some places, it allowed the wash to see behind our flood bank. But caution to see at first, because he ever bold the battalion started to make life unpleasant for the Germans on their side with patrolling. Uh, but patrolling in the ordinary sense wasn't appropriate. And what they did was to locate and gain full details of some Bosch position and then during the night send a section along the flood bank to deal with it. Or mines, mines were the biggest curse over uncharted flood banks. Um, and there are some incidents. Uh, Sergeant Cross of the Fog spent apparently all day inventing novelties, which I assume was booby traps, which he laid on the flood banks uh, to, uh, uh, to affect the Germany patrols on the banks. And tanks were occasionally used, and the tanks would drive up, Sherman would get up to the top of the bank and fire a blast of fire on the German side and then would, would withdraw. But of course, they the, the could do that very much because the Germans had their own anti tank weapons. Some of the rafts had been built over the river um, by the Germans so they could get across, and uh, apparently, Irish Bay could knock them out because you couldn't shell them directly. They would try and blow them out with PX. Um, any attempt by our troops to peer over our own flood bank almost always caused casualties. Um, and they said the sound during the night was like a rifle meeting gone mad. There were grenade duels, machine gun fire. And so this went on. And the final quote that I've used from, from Pat Scott's narrative is that the close contact which the Ford companies had with the Germans 
and the endless grenade duels and raids that used to go on made life on the flood banks a great strain. And 48 hours is about as much as anybody could do with different kind of warfare, but they were very, very close, sometimes only 10 yards from each other. So um, now the um, there was um, right. Well, look, I'm going to go on to this gentleman here. Uh, that is uh, Count Andrew Tanofsky. Oh, Andrew Crow. Count Andrew Tanofsky from the Carpathian Lancers. Um, and Pat Scott says, your entente cordiale with our Polish neighbours was excellent. Uh, we uh, established a direct communication at all levels. And, get, and they gave me a most amusing person as liaison officer, Count Andrew Tanofsky from the Polish army. Great character and caused us a lot of laughter at one time or another. And he was a pretty hard case called Pat Scott. Um, and one of the things, this is, uh, Andrew Tonowski in Rome, um, after it was liberated. He's got the date. Uh, well, it's in June. Well, I think it's later, actually. It looks like it's a winter photograph. So Andrew Tonowski, one of his comrades visiting Rome, a tremendous experience for anybody from Poland. And one of the things that lasting, um, we're very, very pleased to have this in our possession because this was uh, the Irish Brigade songbook including all you know hardy favorites as the soldier's song and uh sash uh was handed over and autographed uh to um andrew tonoski on st patrick's day so patrick's day the irish brigade were in the field on the 17th of march 1945 and you can see that st patrick's day 1945 it's signed by a host of people he could never read their signatures, of course, including Pat Scott. There's Pat Scott's signature there. And I think this is all the company commanders. I don't know. Somebody have to. But this, 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 uh, this document, which was handed over, was kept in the possession of Count Tanaski. It was passed on to his daughter. And his daughter gave it to us. It's right, isn't it, Richard? A couple of years ago. Richard? Anyway, Richard O'Sullivan. Richard? Can you say something about this, Richard, this, this songbook? Yes, it was. His uh, daughter, Margaret, who actually we hope might join us today, she sent it up to us from, um, from the middle of England. And uh, got, her father kept good memories of his time with the Irish Brigade. He had met them previously, I think, in Casino, near yeah, Monte Costellone originally. And then he continue as liaison over the next few months whenever the Polish Carpathians were nearby. So yeah, we have this. Margaret Goldfork is, was his daughter. So we received it. It's a well-known book. In actual fact, I got another of these books yesterday. Another veteran handed it over, or the veteran's family handed it over yesterday. So we have a multitude of books with very dirty front covers, but uh, uh, good memories. Thanks for our Richard. So um, this is, do you remember we were talking about the Bund? In 1945, that's the senior flood bank and the course of the senior. I believe in 45, there was actually a gap here. There wasn't a lock. And I don't think that canal had been built. This is a, it's a cross canal. Uh, but the Germans had a position on the Bund, on the, on the bank, and they could look in all directions. And it was decided that this was intolerable. Um, on the 16th of March, the London Irish relie had relieved the fogs and the flood banks. So they took over the main stretch of the front and immediately started to cause their opponents problems. They got all the hallmarks of a Bala Bradian operation. Um, and this culminated in the afternoon of the 22nd of March with the raid. Um, so the bunt was the flood bank slightly higher than the others, which ran in a semicircle out from the straight river flood bank. So it's bulged out. There was a big gap to see where the where the lock gate now is. I think it's a lock gate to some other structure. Um, there was a big gap about 15 yards wide in the bunt, about a third of the way along it, which could be covered by snipers from the enemy post. <coughs> so um, it was decided to, to do something about it. And, uh, and it was quite a collaborate operation. Um, smoke was put down by two-inch mortars, uh, patrols, 
uh, were sent out on a nightly basis. A tunnel was started to dig through the uh, Bund to from the Irish case side through to the German side uh, on the or the northern side of the southern bank. It's not the northern bank; it's the southern bank. And they they dug that. They finally got through actually to a German dugout in the end. Um, uh, so the uh, and then they had a reserve company to follow up the initial attack, and the raid was carried out about uh, three o'clock in the afternoon when the enemy was expected to be asleep or unprepared. So at three minutes to zero, smoke canisters were lit and thrown on the bank, along the banks, and then at one minute to zero, the artillery mortars came down, targets were hammers of sniper fire, and then um, at, uh, at zero hour, the um, the London Irish broke through onto the northern side of the southern bank um, and rushed over. There'd been a, the mines had been cleared um, and the, uh, the, uh, the raid party comprised men from the 17th platoon of H Command, uh, Company of, it, of the London Irish Rifles commanded by uh, John Lothney. And it was led, the actual raiding party was led by Lieutenant Salt. So the, we do actually have a very good sequence of photographs in the, from the Imperial War Museum which shows a lot of the activity and I, I put it in, in a kind of order to give a sense. This was a photograph taken before the raid with the London Irish positions on the southern on the southern side of the southern flood bank and you can see the mortars, brain guns and this is an outpost. Stick your head up there and you're likely to get it shot off because the Germans are on the other side of the bank and actually on the, on the northern bank and actually on the other side of this bank were very close, very dangerous and they were constant mortaring. So it was very much like a very, very close front line fighting from the First World War. Uh, this is a photograph of, I've got his name here, no, I don't, but he's a London Irish Rifles Corporal. And uh, this photograph was taken. I, I believe that's Eric Salter, actually. No, it's not Eric Salter. It's not Eric no, Salter. No, there, the sequence of photographs includes Eric Salter. Oh, well, oh, no, it isn't. It Martini. Is a, is Sorry, Martini. It's, not, it's yeah. not Martini, Richard Aaron. I know it isn't. This I've got the name, but he was a corporate, and it was he was in the outpost, London Irish outpost. He's got a Thompson machine gun. You can see the look and feel the kit he's wearing. And this photograph is taken of London Irish rifles preparing for the attack. You can see they they got the telecommunications telephone wire, which has been dragged along, uh, and you've got other kit and equipment. You can see the equipment they're using. At this point, and this is taken, I believe, on the day of the attack. This is actually taken in the afternoon of the attack on the uh, 22nd of March, 1945. This is the commander. This is Lieutenant Edward Salter, who was um, the commanded the the successful raid because uh, they they went in and came out in seven minutes. And Edward Salter was actually recommended and received. Uh, military cross for this operation and you can see there he's got his uh, his grenade this was photograph was taken i believe only minutes before the attack started so they it was a bit of a publicity stunt i suspect they told the photographers to be there we're going to do a big raid so it's very well recorded and these are the only photographs i think of an irish brigade operations taken in real time before it actually took place so there he is he's got his pistol uh he seems to have a thompson machine gun and he's got his, his tin helmet and the mandatory Irish Brigade officer moustache. Can't forget. Now, this photograph is taken of them actually going into the tunnel. So, this is the raiding party from the tunnel, and this is what they were carrying. I, I, I don't know what they got around their, their backs is that ammunition, but they, these, are, these are the riflemen. I think someone's got a club here, actually. Uh, but this is guys carrying a rifle. So, they're going to do a effectively what would be a, a trench raid. This photograph is taken just minutes before zero. And this photograph is a London Irish, one of the uh, the raiding party. He don't have his name. He's a London Irish rifles brain gunner, and he's just going down into the tunnel, and they're going to break through to the other side and surround whatever Germans they may be. As you can see, the photographs. I mean, this is we're now moving into you know live action Second World War photography, and this is actually taking place as it was happening. Now, this photograph is uh, of the covering mortar. Um, operation and it shows rifleman William Parking and he's the loader um, from Sheffield and the chap holding the mortar and I think it's uh, 
Is it two inch? Richard? Two inch water? Anyway, as you can see, it's 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 one that any platoon who did these specialist, do these specialist equipment, anybody could carry it and a specialist training. The man actually holding the uh, the mortar on this is on the 22nd during the raid, and they were firing cover, was John Sullivan from Limerick. So uh, the O'Sullivan family, at least my great great grandfather, Daniel Sullivan O'Sullivan, came from Limerick. We may have been, in fact, related. And this is another shot along the bank. The, this is the bunt, I think, the curve of the bunt, the smoke coming up. And I think that's here, a couple of the London Irishmen going through, uh, going through the bunt to the other side. So this is as close as I think we've got from the. I mean, there are some other examples of photographs. I think we've got photographs of skins returning from attack, we've got prisoners been taken to casino. But this is, I think, the only photographs we've seen so far actually recorded in the, uh, the Irish Brigade in action in the Second World War. And this is a very famous celebration. I mean, it's one of the most iconic photographs of the Irish Brigade in the Second World War. It shows Sergeant Martini during this attack lobbing grenades from the London Irish Brigade outpost on the southern bank. Now, Sergeant Martini, an Italian. By this point, the Irish Brigade was pretty polyglot, not all from Ireland. And here we are again, throwing out what appears to be a second one. And we've got his colleague here, a sergeant, carrying his uh, communications radio. Uh, and that was the reality. By this time, March is the weather's getting better. As you can see, it's a very sandy uh, operation, a uh, very sandy place. That was highly successful. And um, there was a German counterattack soon after um, against the fogs further along the to the to the west. Um, the fogs are really the skins, and that was on the 21st of March. And this photograph is. Um, this is a photograph of the German prisoners taken by the London Irish Rifles. Rather betraggled is a sad looking group of four men. This is the London Irishman chasing the poor unfortunate creatures uh, into captivity, although I suspect they weren't that bothered. There were four, uh, four prisoners taken, one, two, three, four, and a fifth was wounded. Uh, this, is, this is a live sequence. So I think this was probably set up, this was set up by the, the, the uh, the community, you know, the Irish propaganda, uh, the army propaganda department, you want a, some action film of a very successful raid on the Senio and the Irish Brigade would be excellent cast for this. Now, this photograph appears in your book, I think, Richard, isn't it? I think it's in your book. I don't know, <laughs> to be honest. Okay, well, um, Richard O'Sullivan will look for it. I think it's around the Trezignano section. I don't know. Oh no, it's not in your book. I think it's in uh, it's in John Horsfall's book. Uh, yes. So this is John Horsfall's book here, and it's got a photograph here. It says a pair of German stretcher bearers, hardly enemies, nor treated as such. <laughs> but the, this photograph from the Imperial War Museum actually gives more detail, and they, 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 this shows what the um, Imperial War Museum were actually deserters to the Irish Brigade were taken on the 29th of March on the Senior River. And the account by the Imperial War Museum, for, uh, the Imperial War Museum, um, from the photo photographs of the Imperial War Museum, this, this chap here is a German. And in order to ensure that nobody shot at him, he uh, took exceptional eff efforts and he put on a, a Red Cross badge in order to nip over without anybody taking a shot. And this one here with a happy smile and a very elegant hairstyle is in fact a Frenchman who had been pressed into the German armed forces in some way, who knows? So he, they both looked quite pleased and who could blame them really? Um, the war was nearly over, what's the point? Um, and they've got a few more photographs. This is a nice one uh, of Irish Brigade from Senior. Uh, this is Skins Fusilier Rogers from Antrim, who joined uh, the, uh, the six Skins, no, the second Skins in 1940. He was wounded in Antia and returned. Uh, so this is him in the senior, looking pretty pleased with himself. He's seen a lot of action. Uh, must be living the hope that he would get home, you know, and see his family. So uh, a rather typical, you know, Irish Brigade photograph here. Uh, 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 you know, dentistry could be improved, but that's true of everybody. But someone who's still got the appetite for a, for a bit of a punch up. Uh, but there are some softer photos. This one is uh, taken in Granarolo to record the map. It's the little village south of the line, and this was used as the brigade's HQ. Um, 
I think I've got a name here. No, I don't. But he, as you can see from the London Irish rifles, they've got a villa here. Do you see that? Villa D Day Drudges. So they've got a, they, they're taking the Mickey out of the alleged Lady Esther slight on the British Army in the Eighth, uh, the Eighth Army in Italy. And I think he's on a universal carrier. I think he might be. We've got something else doodle on the front here. But he's looking pretty happy. Spring is coming, war's almost over. Uh, this is a very touching photograph again of a London Irishman and Grenoble Arolo. Uh, this is Lance uh, Corporal Harold Freud from Hitchin. Uh, he's actually married with a three year old daughter and he's, he's having a little fun with a little Italian boy. You know, he's uh, at that point undoubtedly missing his family. Couldn't resist the sight of this little boy with a lovely smile. And I suspect the little Italian boy was very pleased to see a British soldier who might be able to give him some sweeties or cigarettes or whatever. Anyway, after this, four days after the um, after the the attack around that, the Irish Brigade was relieved, and during the ten year flood banks battle, it lost fourteen killed, dozens wounded, and several were later died wounds. And one of the Irish Brigade members to die was Lieutenant Morris Young, as a photographer. Um, he grew up in Bangor at school, and he was an outstanding sportsman, athletics and tennis. He excelled, played rugby for the first 15 of his score and cricket for his first 11. In 1939, he entered McGee College. He was going to study to be a Presbyterian minister. But in his third year at college, he enlisted in the Royal Mith Artillery as a gunner. So there's, there's lots of stories here, which is not representative of the Irish Brigade, but it captures some of the spirit of the Irish Brigade. Uh, these are men who are well-educated, who had hopes for a completely different kind of life. He was going to be a minister and would undoubtedly raise him to great heights. He chose volunteer because there was no prescription or not he volunteered for the Royal Artillery. Um, and he served in England initially after being recommended. And then he, he obtained a commission, so he started in the ranks and his transfer to the infantry was posted to Italy in 1944. And in the 30th of November, 1944, he joined B Company of the Skins, Two Skins. Uh, while they were in the Solaro Valley, which is after the Spaduro fighting. On the 20th of March, 1945, the skins have been deployed along the Sydney for 11 days, and a fighting patrol supported by armour and led by Young, so he led it. So I, I find the patrols that were going up occasionally to the floodbanks, moved out after first sight to destroy an enemy position on the floodbank, and Young climbed the floodbank, and a machine gun opened up from the German unit, who had moved there unbeknown to anybody overnight, and he was killed. Um, and another man was wounded then. Young is buried at the Fayenza Commonwealth War Grave Cemetery. I mean, it's a sad story, but these young men, uh, so close to the end of the war, so close to coming home to their families, and such an, you might say, a tra an un un unavoidably tragic death. It was just by chance got caught out. Um, and there you are, so many stories like that. But there There's is a interesting point about his cap badge, Harry. What is it? Um, the cap badge says his first battalion, rather than the skilling fusiliers, the, the two regular battalions have different cap badges. Mm. Uh, I suspect that possibly by early 1945, the second battalion had run out of their castle cap badges and had started issuing the burst and grenade badge to everybody. But there'd been a huge controversy in the Enniskillings about the badges in between the wars. And it cost the regiment quite a bit of money. But not one to be dwelling on at the moment. You 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 no, you were not aware of his family or any friends or Morris Young post war, never got a mention, I suppose. Yeah, one of many that they lost. Um, right, but there is a happier twist to this tale because on the 26th of March, the brigade was replaced by the 11th Brigade, and he went back to Billets in Forley. And on the 29th of March, it celebrated very late in the day, St. Patrick's Day. And they were joined in this celebration by the North Irish Horse and by the 1st Battalion of the London Irish Rifles, is the, uh, the senior of the two battalions, who were also on the same front. So there was, at that point, Forley seemed to be full of Irishmen who were marching around with their corbines and their hackles and their different covers, and generally remarked on for their very smart appearance. The Irish Brigade had a reputation for looking pretty funky. Um, and on the St. Patrick's Day, which was held on the 29th, 
um, began with church services. And the Roman Catholics went to the Forney Cathedral under Dan Kelleher, who was the Catholic uh, padre for the Irish Brigade, who got the military cross uh, for bravery at um, Cairo in the casino uh, theatre. That was back in April. And the rest, or the, you know, the non-Catholic uh, denominations, the service was officiated by Victor Pike. I don't know if you've heard of him, Richard. He was an Irish rugby, <laughs> Irish rugby international from Tipperary. He was the Eighth Army's Eighth Army's Army Chaplain General. So a very distinguished chap, chap, Victor Pike. And afterwards, the battalions formed up in St Andrew's Square, uh, which is in the heart of Forney, and it's still completely intact and is, is as it was today. Today is as it was then. And they were dressed both by Pat Scott and by General Keatley, who was by then the Fifth Corps Commander. Who had actually been the 78th commander until August 1944. Um, the shamrock was supplemented by local, what some people called local green weeds, because there wasn't enough shamrock. The shamrock would be shifted in front, but there wasn't enough to go around. So it was supplemented by local growth that looked a bit like shamrock and was distributed in the trunks and pipes of the three battalions and the first London Irish rifles played at the square. Now, this photograph shows you Keatley here. This is actually in the square on the 29th of March. And there he is. He's got his uh, core command. He's got his core flash up, and he's. What was that, Richard? It's five core. Five core flash and his full yeah. rank, mm -hmm. and that is Pat Scott without his hat on, um, and he's putting his shamrock on his uh, on his core beam. Uh, the underscaling behind there with the tray of shamrock is actually wearing the first battalion badge as well on the uh, red triangular flash of the underscalings. Good, thank you very much, fantastic. And so here's further photograph of his Keatley. I think that may be Bala Braden. Do you think that, that might? That is Bala, yep. yeah. and you can see, I think you suspect that, uh, is that Bala Braden or is it Mosley? No, it's Bala Braden. And you can see Keatley, they knew each other really well. Well, Keatley was also uh, an Irish soldier. He was right. from in an Irish cavalry regiment. That's right. And this gentleman here in between them, I believe that's Mervyn Davies. I think it is. Who I that, think it is as well. Yeah. He was then a, a major. He was E, e Company Commander, uh, the formation of the, the uh, company in the London Irish. My father had been in, uh, was in for the whole of the Second World War. So again, this is in St. Andrew's Square. And this is the mass pipe brands of the Irish Brigade, uh, the first London Irish Rifles marching and this is the the men of broken ranks and they're enjoying the sound and the spectacle of you know and a very a very difficult beat of a marching Irish band and afterwards we'll come to this in a moment um the parade was followed by a riotous sergeants sergeants versus officers football matches organized by the London Irish and the Fogs and Ted O'Sullivan that's how my father recorded his memoirs uh, events in the Irish Brigade St. Patrick's Day 1945 in Thorley. He said the he said the sergeants uh, and the London Irish officers versus Sarge, uh, the sergeant uh, got out two panther tanks stolen from the park of captured German vehicles. So they nicked a couple of panther tanks. And the officers were retaliated by having uh, our air corporation squadron dive bomb the match with smoke bombs. And uh, I think in the fog smash. I think Robbie Robinson was just about to score a goal when someone blew the, uh, the, the football post up, didn't they? So um, they knew how to party. And these are men who had been living under intense, intense pressure for months and sometimes years. And this is their opportunity to really let off steam. And they really let off steam. And they believe this is the end. This is coming to the close. And they were really letting it go. Um, and the party went late into the night. And the next day, despite many hangovers, the Irish Brigade started training for their final operation of war uh, on the Cothic line up to Argent, and we'll come to that in our next. Um, but I've got another sequence of photographs showing the, uh, this is a photograph, the, there was a horse race, and uh, this gentleman was falling on his backside, it was like a, what do you think, it's a fog? It's falling off his horse. So they were playing rough games, you know, they, they, there were quite a few injuries, and they were Skittles games. Uh, I like this photograph, because it's the London Irish Rifles. Uh, and that's Barla Brady, who I think tried to dress up as a mafia. 
it is, this is the officer's team. This is the officer's football team. So Barnabas is drafted out as Mafia. Uh, John Lofting, who was, as I mentioned, he had commanded the, uh, the company that had successfully raided. The company was H Company. He got an MC for that. And his elder brother had premature, his elder brother had been in the first percent of the London Irish Rifles and had dead died uh, about a year or nine months earlier. Uh, and that's Fitzgerald, not a large I don't know what he's wearing, he's into wearing pajamas. And this medal in the middle here, I think, is someone called Rodney Coburn, who before the war had been a Daily Mirror journalist and was a journalist after the war. And there they, uh, there they are. And I, I'm not sure whether, I think this is before they started playing because. Uh, According to my uh, uh, my father's account, it said by the end of the match, that's the London Irish officers were surgeons. Most of the players had had their clothes torn off, and the Italian ladies watching seemed to be appreciative. So it's kind of you know completely over the top. Uh, this is the I think the Fogs playing soccer. It's their own game. I don't know if you can spot anybody there, but uh, and um, this is the effects of the gin on the Irish Brigade. Uh, the, it, it was apparently industrially, it was industrial alcohol I think they used, and it was kind of super strength. And I know my father has no memory whatsoever of most of the day, because he's not a heavy drinker, he'll stop ever in his life. And he just asked for gin and toilet on gin, and it's so strong it just knocked him out. Uh, and that was the end of his particular day, but, uh, and that's the end of this particular Zoom. Thank you very much for attention. Just to say that the third and final of this North Italian campaign session is going to be held on the 11th of October, two weeks at six o'clock. And it will be about the one of the most successful Allied military operations of the Second World War, uh, which is basically Operation Grapeshot, which is the final breakthrough uh, in the Gothic line that took uh, the Allied armies right into Southern Third Reich and uh, led to the end of the war, the, the final surrender of the German forces in Italy. So thank you very much. Thanks, Eddie. Um, excellent. Uh, may I ask a couple of questions, not of you, but um, Richard Doherty, um, you mentioned in the middle of the cast that, um, that Mark Clark was in charge of 15th Army Group uh, and in charge of the 5th Army, Lucien Trusker and Richard McCreary. Can you... Go a little bit more into detail about how those dynamics were working at this stage. Well, Clark um, absolutely detested British soldiers. He had no time at all for them. The irony of that is that he seemed to spend a lot of his time with British soldiers. Uh, I, I, I knew two personally who talked about meeting him, one of them being my father and the other being my best friend's father. Uh, and the, the story there was that he was actually asked by Tommy McCready, my friend's father, why he spent so much time with the Brits. And the regiment was in British increment with the army. And uh, he quite candidly said to Tommy McCready, uh, my back's safe with British soldiers. He was detested in the American army. Uh, and in fact, those in 36th uh, Texas and Oklahoma division would probably have taken any opportunity they, they, they got to have a lynch party uh, with Clark as the, the guest of honor. Um, he succeeded General Alexander, who became the Supreme Commander in the Mediterranean in October of uh, 1944. Um, he thought that the Army was worn out and couldn't do anything. Uh, he intended the final offensive to be a Fifth Army offensive with the Brits lending a bit of a hand with the linings, as he called them. Uh, instead of that, the two army commanders got together. Interestingly, both of them were cavalry men. Uh, Richard McCreary, a, a lancer, uh, an Irish man from um, Kilikloher outside Oma. His, his family came from there. Uh, and uh, Truscott, also of Irish descent, uh, an American cavalry man. There's something significant about the fact that this all arms battle that we're going to look at on the 11th of October was actually organized by two cavalry men and then presented to Clark as a fait accompli. And there was nothing he could do about it at that stage. Um, as, as Eddie has said, it actually is the finest example of all arms maneuver carried out by the Western Allies anytime during the Second World War. Uh, and it was two worn out armies, an understrength Fifth Army and an allegedly worn out 
it violated did it sadly it's been all forgotten uh, all but forgotten in the years since in spite of the fact that churchill said it was something that, that, that deserved to go down in the annals of military history as a magnificent victory can you mention also that you wrote a book about it recently uh yes i did write a book about it it's, it's called victory in italy um and funny enough when you were when we were looking at Bassanio there i i uh, led a battlefield study with uh, uh, the royal welsh uh, way back in december of 20 13 in northern Italy. Uh, funnily enough, the weather was quite pleasant. Uh, and we started off on the Senegal Bank. And uh, I had the citation for the, the, the father or the friend of mine, or friend of mine's father in law, uh, Rex Doherty, a sergeant in the skins. He had a mention in dispatches of Anzio, and he got the military medal on the Senegal uh, for not only tackling a German machine gun post, but also rescuing one of his soldiers who had been wounded. Um, and um, I started reading this and the, the major who was organizing the uh, thing laughed and I said, no, no, he might be called to heart. He was absolutely no connection. He's a dairy man, I'm a drone man. Uh, so we, we covered the, the Senio. We were in all those towns that we, we looked at, Cotignola, Etc. Uh, Etc. Et and then we followed the uh, the New Zealand division up around the corner and into Trieste. Fascinating uh, battlefield study. And uh, one of the amazing things about it is that we'll probably look at next month is the the Santerno. Uh, and we had a sapper captain because it was a a battle group uh, of the Royal Welsh. And um, we had a sapper captain who, when we talked about how quickly the engineers were able to bridge. The, the Santerno, he said, we haven't got anything today that could bridge that. And these are, uh, if you look at them in, on an Italian map, uh, you'll notice that the Senio is, is not a fiume, a, a river, it's a torrente, it's a stream. Uh, but the stream builds up hugely in the autumn uh, with the autumn rains, and then again in the spring with the, with the snow melt. Unfortunately, in 1845, that didn't happen. Well, thanks very much, Richard. Just Eddie on with me now. Yeah, uh, Robin. Um, no, not much of a reference to your father on this one because in his uh, transcript, he, it's it's rather abbreviated. He has there's a, a there's a far fuller account of his experiences in the Arganta Gap breakthrough. Uh, so we'll be dealing with that at the next session, which is in two weeks' time. So just one yeah, thing. Rob can I ask a question, ask a question yeah. of Richard Doherty? At this point in the war, I mean, I mean, really, it was all over by the shouting, wasn't it? So what were the Allied, what was, what, what was the purpose of the Allied commanders, you know, keeping this front active? Wasn't there a logical case for saying, well, just keep, you know, just, just have a skeleton Allied force in Northern Italy on the Senio on the, on the line? And the main breakthrough is going to take place in Northwest Europe and with Stalin coming from the East. And then of course the Americans with the Anvil operation. At what point, I mean, was there, what is, what were the Allied commanders thinking? Were they at this point actually, I mean, the, the, the German army was in negotiations for the, the surrender of the Germans in Italy had been going on since the start of the year in, in uh, Switzerland with Alan Dulles mm -hmm. in dealing with uh, Wolf. Karl Heim Wartz, one of the world's great scoundrels, who was an SS uh, command. He was secretly negotiating the surrender, attempted surrender of the Italian forces. Um, what was the thinking at that point? Why were they doing it? Were they actually thinking militarily or were they just, was there a political factor that they were aware that Northern Italy was on the brink of open rebellion? The Mussolini regime was collapsing and this void was being filled by the partisan. Um, and that the, do with the Allies influence because the Allied armies at this point had the Royal Italian Army, so the, the king of Italy was on board. So the monarchists were on board the Allied Army, but they were on the Allied side. Was there a, an element of the campaign, as far as you've written your readings, is that we need to fill this vacuum, not for its military purposes, because the German army effectively was defeated, 
you know, he was he wasn't going to be decisive. The, the Italian campaign was going to be decisive, but we need to get up into Italy. We need to control the the Po Valley where the main industrial towns are, because the whole place could, you know, just become take, be taken over by communist partisans. Is there any evidence of that? That was influenced there, people's thinking. There, there is. It, it doesn't. Say, it certainly didn't affect Clark's thinking. Clark's thinking was uh, for the greater glory of, of Mark Clark. Uh, and the two generals simply wanted to prove that their their armies could still operate, but certainly in the, on the um, on the political and strategic viewpoint, uh, there was the very very real threat of the Russians coming into the uh, Lombardy region uh, and taking over that industrial heartland of, of Italy. After all, remember that they took over a large part of Austria, and it wouldn't have taken very much for them to push down. And particularly supported uh, Tito in, in pushing out of Yugoslavia around the corner into northern Italy. Uh, it was 1953, I think, before they got out Trieste. Uh, Trieste was yeah, even later than that, it was still under negotiation. Because you look at this this period of the, the campaign, you, you can see that the decisive front was not Italy. The decisive front was Europe. It was Eastern Europe, and the the bombing campaign. This is the key. Uh, so you do wonder what's going on. It is, and the politics. This is really the some of it is the unsaid story of the Second World War. Is that for a lot of us, the Second World War is a, is a military story. It's the armies, it's the commanders, it's the logistics, and all that sort of stuff. And with Churchill at the top, you know, making inspired speeches, Stalin, all that kind of stuff. But you do the more you look at the the Irish Brigade campaigns, you know, in in Northwest Africa, was highly politicised. The reason why they went there. Was all to do with politics, almost nothing to do with military strategy. And the Northern Italian campaign, you think, well, all these young men, you know, putting their lives at risk, why was why were they being asked to do this when it was kind of pointless? Because they were within, you know, they could have just sat there and just drunk tea. The Germans would have continued to surrender, and then the Germans would have collapsed, you know, in in, in a, a collapsed in, in Germany and Eastern anyway, and they could have just taken over. So Sometimes there are things that happen in the war that can only be explained, in my view, by political considerations, which don't get people's attention. Just one other thing about it is in the next story, and I dealt with it previously, I will briefly touch on the Irish Brigade occupation of Austria, which uh, Robin Wilton, your father, was very much, you know, an eyewitness to. And the, at that point, the, the considerations were the application of the auto agreement. Uh, which went that the, the, the 78th Division from the middle of May was executing the agreement between Stalin, Church and Roosevelt about the handing of Russian prisoners of war. And that's where a, a, a different kind of politics, but my feeling is in North Italy, the, the whole of Northern Italy was just exploding into strike action in the Red Bologna, you know, and the Communist Party dominant. And the, the 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 Italian monarchy, which was on the Allied side, we must be concerned. We lose control. The Vatican, of course, the Pope, <laughs> he didn't want to see, uh, you know, a communist system in um, Northern Italy, whether it was Soviet or non-Soviet. So I'm just throwing that into the mix, Richard, as uh, as a, a gratuitous observation. Um, it's, it's a valid observation, but uh, at the at the end of the day, in any war, it's the politicians who draft the policy and the soldiers who carry it out. Uh, so, you know, the, the strategy comes from policy, operations yeah. come from strategy, and uh, what these armies do in the ground is, is a result of all of that. That's right, that's right. Uh, I'll catch you later. Okay. So, Gillian is conversing. Robin sent uh, a note saying that he's got a photograph of his father in Austria on a Lipizzana horse. The Lipizzana horse is gets a, a message, gets a mention in his, his audio recordings. Uh, I think he also talks about his Rolls Royce, doesn't he? Or he has a Mercedes, doesn't he? Yeah, he got a Mercedes staff car at one point when they were taking over um, from in somewhere in Austria. Yes, that's right. He, 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 he got a top of the range Mercedes and a Lipizzana. No, yeah, that's not going to come out. He said um, there, there was a lot of what he described as horse worship went on um, in uh, in Austria, and he, by a stroke of fortune, ended up with a horse that had been he think used to pull ammunition carts or, or something, um, but was actually a little bit He said it, it probably saved his life at one stage when he was 
having having only just learned to ride i mean i've never had an opportunity to ride before then galloping through a forest in austria with it and it suddenly leapt clean over a felled tree which he said probably would have taken him out if the horse hadn't known what to do yeah your father's account is that he had a very negative experience with the mule i think in tunisia where his face kicked in uh and he was out. Sicily. Sicily, Sicily, actually. Sicily, yes, Sicily. Sicily. Shortly, shortly after Centuripe, uh, he yeah. was very lucky actually that the hoof actually bounced off his um, binoculars um, and so it only caught his face a glancing blow. Um, I don't know what happened to the binoculars, um, but I have inherited um, a, a pair of binoculars um, from him, <laughs> which when I look at the serial number on them are actually German naval issue. <laughs> Um, which he picked up somewhere along the line. <laughs> well, your dad got around, I think. There's more than one possible explanation for the things in his possession. I know that he, uh, he did get around. It's a uh, fantastic story. Thank uh, you. And, and interestingly about uh, Sir John was that he, he got uh, malaria, as most did, but he got that in the casino area, didn't he? I think, or later on, not in Sicily. And secondly, he got pneumonia or ear infection from swimming in Stanley Bay in Alexandria, which exactly as our father got. That's Possibly right. saved his life because he missed the Monte Spaduro. He missed Spaduro. Yeah, missed Spaduro. And I, yes. And I think John Wilton, your father, didn't get back to the brigade until in late autumn, didn't he? He missed yeah, some I, part of it. I believe so. My, my chronology of it isn't quite as, as detailed as yours. Um, yeah. But he certainly... There's a point where he mentioned like, like um, he he was getting what they then called jaundice, and was probably hepatitis um, at one point, and but had to supervise the rum issue, and it it absolutely turned him up, and he could never um, drink rum. Um, he'd managed a G and T, but rum just wouldn't work. <laughs> yeah, the the junior officer or the uh, sergeant major, the responsibility for dishing out the rum before they went to attack. That's when it was used. Eddie, you're still recording. Do you want to stop the recording? Up well, I, what I'm going to say, I'm just saying I'm going to stop recording here, but I'm not going to. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, thank you. Um, <laughs>